Okay, welcome to the uh, you know, City Commission coordination meeting for May the 4th, 2021. I guess we'll start off just uh, if anybody has any comments on the tentative uh, agenda, you know, coming up rather than read it all in the interest of time, just if there's anything there that you've got concerns about or if there's something missing. And I just want to clarify one thing on there. Now, a couple of us uh, got the little briefing on the proposed uh, Art and Light Museum, and I assume that's what we have on the June 1st agenda here, where it says amend star bond redevelopment plan. That's correct. Okay. And and I guess there's what there's two things that have to happen to make this project go forward. One is the star bond redevelopment plan, and then second is I guess we have to do something about the land. So there'll be a, a number of actions. Uh, the initial one be, would be to amend the plan. Uh, we've got to get uh, a formal approval from the state uh, as a result of amending the plan. You can kind of we kind of did this when we did the uh, museum proposal out on Kimball. So right, the Snyder you amended museum, right. the plan. Then you you have a project proposal. You get approval by the state, and then we start a whole process of. Uh, actually uh, uh, starting to develop the issuance of the bonds. So okay. there's a number of steps that we have to go through and we can <clears throat> certainly lay that, <clears throat> lay that out a little bit more, but the, the initial step is to uh, amend the redevelopment plan. The, the benefit is location being in the South Redevelopment <laughs> District uh, doesn't require <laughs> us to amend the zone. So because we're already in the zone. So that we had that step as part of the Kimball, which we don't have in this place, so we're already okay. jumping to amending the plan. So Okay, so tentatively we have that on the June first agenda. It could move okay. uh, could move up, could move back. It kinda depends right. on but I think it, it has to get on there by about the first to meet their timeline. Yeah, I was gonna say is this um I don't know if it needs a second reading or however many readings, but uh, my understanding was they needed something for us to be discussing uh, and make a decision before July 1st because they have to move forward with some of the state uh, state legislative issues as well dealing with this. So I just want to make sure we're giving enough time regardless of what, what happens but for our discussion to take place. Uh, and Jason, you're the key person here because your name keeps coming up in this discussion and you are the knower of all things regarding star bonds. So um, if we can move it up, I certainly don't mind for May 18th, but I'm not sure if that's doable or not. So Jason Hilders, Deputy City Manager, there's just a couple points of clarification I would offer. The applicant is a little confused over the July 1 date and I did just communicate with Tracy this evening. We've been in contact with Bond Council as well as the Department of Commerce. They're both of the opinion, Bond Council and the Department of Commerce, that if we get through an amended plan, and as Ron mentioned, the Secretary actually issues a statement saying it's eligible and it's something he is going to consider approving, we satisfy the legal obligation to meet the July 1 deadline. Following July 1 then, as Ron described, multiple agreements, bonds, and the structure of this thing can take place after July 1. So they're a little bit confused over the timing of what needs to occur and when it needs to occur. And we really need to rely on the Department of Commerce and the Secretary to provide us the direction necessary to move forward. What you have within your control is an ordinance that has to be considered to amend the plan. So given our current rules, it will take two readings to do that. So June 1, June 15 meets the deadline and, and we anticipate doing that. Uh, we do need the Secretary to weigh in on this project before we really get past this July 1 deadline. If we just take action on an amended redevelopment plan and the secretary never weighs in, it's not approved. It's not moving forward. When we amended our district boundary, 
on Kimball for the Snyder facility, and we had a letter in hand from the Commerce Interim Director indicating it was eligible and they supported the project. So we need that letter. What actually needs to happen probably in the next 15, 20 days is for the city and the DeBryans to go to Topeka and have a more in-depth conversation with the secretary to see if they're going to support this project. So there's enough time if we start on this one June yeah. to make it happen. I wanted yeah. to be sure we had plenty Bond of Bond Council and Legal Council for Commerce have talked about and agreed with each other that our obligations are satisfied by the amended redevelopment plan in order to secure where this thing needs to be prior to July 1. The other piece to that was the uh, discussion of the $2 million in this current star bond, I think. Does that have any impact on anything else in, in this, but the deadline? If it doesn't, then I'm okay with that. But if it has, regarding the deadline, I, I was just curious about where that falls in. Yeah, and there, there again, there's some confusion about that two million and the July one deadline. I would just reiterate: Bond Council and Legal Council for the Department of Commerce both agreed. If the commission takes action on the amended redevelopment plan, it would qualify for the rules prior to the new ones kicking in after July. So I understand they've come up with a dollar figure on getting this done before July 1. Um, that doesn't necessarily impact the city. Yeah, that would impact the project. So it wouldn't necessarily kill it. And honestly, I haven't even seen the financials or the equation that they're using as to why it would cost two more million dollars. I haven't seen that. Neither has Bond Council and neither has the state. So. I can't really comment to the $2 million figure. I don't know where they're pulling that from. An actual meeting, uh, but I would like to see it like uh, sure. um, Wynn was saying, sooner than later. I do think we're going to need till June 1, just, just given what needs to take place with Bond Council and the Secretary. I, I really wouldn't, I mean, we could take action without that letter. Um, but you're, you're going to be sitting here wondering and waiting, is the secretary going to approve this project or not? And you will have an amended plan adopted. Possibly, we could do that. But I know in the past, uh, the one other time we tried to amend, we had that letter in hand. So that's what we'll be trying to do before June 1, is secure that. And there could be even some discussion and communication between the readings as well. So. Okay, if that timeline will work, then great. That's uh, that's the only question I had there. And then, then the other thing that, uh, you know, in our pending thing, you know, we still have that rental lease addendum and then the, the flood thing. And I guess noise ordinance, too. You know, not noise ordinance, but, uh, you know, the Fort Riley noise thing that getting put on people's leases. So the noise notice has been done. That's done, okay. Yeah. And, and so, so people... If they buy property or rent property or notified as part of that process, that Fort Riley goes boom in the dark. If you're in that zone okay. uh, on the deed, there's a deed note uh, that the county has placed. Exactly. Uh, that wasn't anything the city has done okay. other than we also adopted uh, the elements of that plan. Uh, as part of our comp plan. So that, that notice is what's uh, uh, in that disclosure statement. Okay, because I'm not sure everybody fully understands that, some of the comments I've seen the past couple of weeks. Okay. That, so I'll have to figure out how to clarify that. We can have an update on that. So bring that up in staff meeting tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, it might be a good thing to, you know, put out on social media just say, here, you know, here's the deal because sure. there's still some people concerned about, you know. And I thought it was taken care of, but I I, I knew it, it couldn't have been a city ordinance because right. I don't remember seeing that. So, okay, that, that explains it. And then if we could, you know, get that flood and rental lease addendum put on there so everybody knows they can call the code office, that would be helpful. I know staff's working. I don't know, Katie, if you have a comment at all on on that and where we're at. I know we're working on it in conjunction with some other things. This is Katie Jackson, city attorney. We have it basically drafted. We just need to resolve some um, issues 
staff need to resolve regarding enforcement and how it will be handled. It'd be ready when we have that guidance. Okay. Well, as long as it's moving along, Close. I'd like to get it done here by the, you know, you know, end of July, beginning of August, if possible. Sure. Okay. Other comments on the agenda? While you're looking, I had a couple of comments I'd like to make relative to it, just, just for your all's awareness. Uh, on the May 18th agenda, consent item three, there's a condemnation process. This is for the Safe Routes to School project. So this uh, particular area is out in the Butterfield edition. You might recall that that originally was a private development and has narrow street easements um, and narrow streets specifically and no sidewalk infrastructure at all uh, and so part of the safe routes to school project is connecting with the city uh, original in city that have sidewalks to the north of that area through that subdivision to the Northview Elementary School which also has sidewalks that lead up to the development we've had good cooperation from many of the property owners uh, to put these routes in however there are uh, several out-of-town owners that have been difficult to get a hold of and, and finalize communication with. And I think we're down to one or two uh, that uh, either aren't, aren't interested in having a sidewalk or, and, and I haven't uh, come to agreement. And so that's the purpose of starting this process. Okay, so I think I, the commission might have gotten an email from at least one person. I, I think that was sent to all of us, not just me. You didn't I didn't know, remember it. seeing oh, it. Are, are they? Is there some kind of cost share arrangement with the homeowner has to pay for part of it, or is just no? We this is hundred percent city finance. You know, our, our biggest challenge in trying to put sidewalks in where there have never been sidewalks is people have to inherit the maintenance of that sidewalk, and yeah. most po folks don't want that extra burden. So, so that they'll they'll be a public hearing. They'll have yes. the capability on yes. that night. That's what I told the individual. And and he, he was concerned it was going to lower the value of his property, I think. And, so, and I knew it wasn't going to cost him anything, but, but that didn't make sense to me. But Getting kids so, uh, in the I, neighborhood to school is a benefit. Right. I, is that item three? Re it just says resolution, and I can't. So we have to do a resolution to start the process? It's item three. It and then there's a public hearing it. after that? It doesn't say where. Well, I did. It's condemnation process. That's all. It doesn't say where. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, and that's why I wanted to give you that background. Yeah, thank it, you. That, that's the older neighborhood south of Butterfield, right? A lot of those, yes. those horseshoe yes. cul-de-sac yeah. loop exactly. streets. Okay, correct. Those were the only sidewalks over there right. for years. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing on the back, on the work session schedule, uh, we have, uh, so uh, several of you were commenting about uh, some fifth Tuesday. So June 29th is a fifth Tuesday. We had planned a update on the Manhattan Development Code for that night, but the July 6th meeting was pretty open. Uh, and to give uh, additional time between the planning board review of the item and your review, we've, we've tentatively moved that off of that meeting and given you that fifth, twos fifth Tuesday off. Okay. Uh, and move that to the July 6th for discussion session. So. Okay, thanks for letting us Yep. Know. It's just when we only get two weeks sometimes, it's hard to plan. Thank you Yep. Mm -hmm. for letting us know. Uh, several other items. I'll try to get through these real quick because I'm sure there's some other things you all have some discussion on. Um, we discovered uh, through some feedback from everyone that uh, the original uh, item for the... Uh, uh, Aggieville request for the special event had the wrong times in the actual ordinance uh, from the application so there's a revised memo and ordinance that uh, clearly defines that the hours for the ordinance that allows the alcohol in the beer gardens coincides with the outside bans uh, from noon to 10 p.m instead of 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. So the whole event starts at 8 a.m. and goes to 11 p.m., but the bands and the alcohol beer gardens are only from noon to 10 p.m. So thanks for bringing that to our attention, and sorry about that. Um, this afternoon, the chamber had a power lunch uh, with Lieutenant Governor 
and Secretary of Commerce David Tolan as the primary speaker, also Trent Armbrust, uh, who you all know, uh, who is now at the Secretary of Com or with the Department of Commerce, um, also participated in that discussion. And the focus was on the Kansas Framework for Growth. In your packet, uh, your mail folder tonight is the cover for that with the index, and this can be found on their website. I wrote that link on there for you. And then I gave you a copy of the PowerPoint that they provided today. So it's a really good presentation. I don't know if the chamber recorded that or not, so whether it can be viewed again, but uh, it, was a, it was a good presentation. Um, there was a, a comment at our last briefing of the like to have maybe some analysis of some of our sales tax reports. We don't have the final report that we've released yet for April, but again, I provided a graph here for you that uh, is our April sales tax and compensating use tax revenue, which is actually February, which you will recall February of 20 was actually a pretty normal month that was pre, I mean, COVID was just becoming aware uh, but it hadn't really had any financial impacts. Um, and so having said that, this February of 21 was certainly still somewhat impacted. So actual sales taxes revenue were down uh, about 1.1%, $19,000, so not too bad. But if you look at that orange graph, the uh, compensating use or the online sales tax uh, uh, is up 46%. Uh, 361 to 195 and I really don't see those numbers coming down much I mean people have gotten in the pattern of shopping online even more so than they did before COVID so during COVID uh, I hope that trend <laughs> reverses itself but uh, you know a lot of people found new places to shop so I'm hoping that uh, our uh, you know if we haven't seen a huge corresponding dip in our local sales tax revenue, which means they are getting out and supporting our businesses. So has the, our businesses uh, uh, try to remain viable? I hope uh, that uh, maybe both of those will go up. That'll be a good problem to have. So uh, I do know there was uh, legislation passed this session or in consideration, I'm not sure it's passed, uh, to further define compensating use and the parameters for collecting. It's, I think they're going to raise that threshold, which would coincide to the uh, South Dakota law and a lot of the, what the other states have collected. If you had to do at least $100,000 worth of business uh, to, to be in order to be reporting it. But the other loophole they went after was the uh, entities that host others, other vendors that weren't collecting the tax. Uh, Amazon does a lot of that. Amazon pays the tax for the products they sell, but they had hosted companies that were selling through them that weren't paying. So it tries to go at it. I think the analysis is, is that we'll still come out ahead even though they're raising the threshold. So I think that was the result. So anyway, uh, we'll try to keep this up. The, the good news is, is with the additional compensating use tax, we were up about 7%. Uh, from an April of 21 versus uh, April of 20. So those, that's good news. Ron, yes. this is uh, Commissioner Reddy. So one of the things with the uh, compensating user uh, use tax, if it does, if they raise that to 100,000, right now it's zero, so everybody pays regardless of what level they're at. Um, I'm sure it's hard for us to tell where we are getting that money from uh, if they're from Manhattan or from the state or from out of state, whatever it might be as far as those online sales taxes. Um, I would like for us to keep an eye on that if that should pass to where the limit is 100,000, how that impacts us. Because uh, my concern is we fought so hard to collect the online tax that now um, it might be going the other way where they're gonna try to make it a little bit harder for us to collect some of that money. We were one of the few states, I think, that didn't have any uh, limit, and it was just blank for everybody had to pay that tax. So I, I'm concerned about how that's going to impact us since that's where we saw um, an increase, but that's where we're going to see an increase for a long time. I don't think those habits are going to change too much. So I just want us to 
do that with caution because they may increase it to 200,000 some other time or even more uh, depending on which businesses are lobbying for what. So um, kind of worried about that. Sure, I, I would hope that uh, the Department of Administration would be able to track that in the revenue because they created that rule initially and they have all those businesses signed up now and if they lose them, they'll certainly have the record of that. So I, I would hope that uh, that's something that, that would be available through them to be able to do. I did uh, get a, a just a notice of uh, the transit guest tax. So uh, April of 20, again, which even though we were in COVID, our gas tax is three months behind. So it reflected January, February, and March of 20. That number was 364,500, and usually those numbers are four to 500,000. Um, in this year, for our April proceeds was 243, 243,000. So it was down about 121,000 or around 33% from a year ago. So obviously uh, that's not as bad as some of them as bid. Our July one last year was 175,000, which was way off. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that one. And as we develop the budget, we'll be uh, bringing some of that to you. Uh, in, on April 22nd, in your mail folder, I wrote a, a memo and attached a letter from the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution uh, with a goal that they'd like to have some a letter of support for Grant. They're seeking to put some historical uh, signage along the linear trail in some of our parks and, and ask commissioners to comment if that's something that you're fine with us proceeding with administratively to support it. Uh, or did you want it to come to the commission meeting? So I didn't hear from anybody, so I've, I'm just verifying that we can proceed administratively to support that. Yeah, and, there's, and there's a small city cost to that, though? Cause we, It'd be a little labor involved. Okay, and that's not a problem to install I don't, signs? We, we don't have a problem. We support the effort. Okay, that, that was my only concern. Otherwise, sure. I'm good. Uh, one other thing in uh, your packet tonight, there's a application to the Riley County Planning and Development. This is for a conditional use permit. Uh, this is to, to go back and get a conditional use on property that already has a conditional use for the same purpose. It was previously approved for the owner to have borrow material there um, for a private use. And so we bought the, that easement and the right to that borrow for the levy project. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that as the owner of that, we have the same official ability to be able to use it for our use instead of the, the regional, originally the conditional use was granted to the owner, this conditional use will be transferred to us. So it's really more of a clarification, it's not a it's the same use, but uh, you may be hearing about that as you see some of the notices. And uh, there's a, a, a nice drawing on the back that kind of shows those tracks that were originally approved for the borrow. And actually, we're taking less of the borrow area than was originally approved in the original conditional use to the owner. So if you have questions about that, you can see me. But I wanted to give you a heads up that you may see some notice about that in your folders this league put out a nice little publication about uh, the uh, tax revenue neutral rate and the deadlines for that and how that's being computed and really I think I said last time July 20th is kind of the new date that we have to report to the county clerk as to what our tax revenue neutral uh, rate is going to or that we're going to exceed that and by how much we're supposed to propose and, and why and in what areas. So they, this year we just do a general notice uh, like we normally would do a published notice of public hearing. Next year then the, the county clerk has to send the actual notices to every, every uh, resident uh, of, the, of the cities and the counties with each of the taxing entities information. So more to come on that is that uh, Develops. We're revising our budget calendar a little bit because of this because it does give us more time and instead of having that budget hearing Typically the first Tuesday in August. It's likely going to be the first Tuesday in September So gives us a little more time to finalize the budget Get those notifications though the, the county Clerk next year, but he, he's only going to send them to property tax 
taxpayers, not every citizen, right? I don't know for sure. I mean, that's because, I mean, the terminology here, it says we'll notify taxpayers. property taxpayer. Yeah. So, so I would think that it's if you pay a property tax bill, you'll get notified. But if you're a renter and you don't pay a property tax bill directly, you won't get notified. Yeah, that I haven't heard that question come up. So okay. that's one yeah. maybe to get some clarification. Yeah, no, I, I really great. don't believe everybody's going to get one. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so does the county deadline change also? Yeah, this applies to everybody. Uh huh. So so we're moving it, the deadline to submit or just the notice. So we have flex. So the notice is really the, the that July twentieth where we have to notice the clerk. Right. Uh, is earlier than we would have normally had you. You know, historically what we've done is we've kind of had a concurrence that this is what we're going to publish. Yeah. Right. Uh, and we usually do that in in late July. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that we're going to have that public hearing knowing that we can always come down and those rules will still be the same um, so that's it's a little bit interesting because they're they're wanting us to be more specific about which which we would we'd have a cap that we would budget uh, then you could still come down from that but it doesn't it's really focused on the property tax element as opposed to the rest of the budget so we'll still have our other public hearing but we'll have them at the same time so what's the difference between July 20th getting the notice to the clerk and uh, the first Tuesday in September what is the first Tuesday in September you mentioned changing the so that would be when calendar. we we have a range of you can dates. you can uh, okay. uh, By September 20th, we have to hold the hearing. Connected. So yeah. okay. it gives us a range of time which we can hold the hearing, which we have that flexibility to, okay. today. All right. Um, and it's just that would be when we would likely recommend that we would hold it, and, and we'll have more discussion about the okay. calendar and stuff when we bring that to you for sure. Okay. But it's a, it gives you it's a good little publication yeah. as to some of the rationale and and different aspects of at least how to implement the legislation that was approved and the governor signed. Looks like a quick reference. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not well, a real quick reference. <laughs> well, and this is Commissioner Reddy. Um, would this have any impact on law board uh, deciding about the budget? Does that also give them the flexibility to, as far as their timeline? So there, there didn't appear to be anything in the legislation that spoke to other entities that have, that approved budgets that report to other taxing jurisdictions. Um, and I was, as I was talking to Rich Vargo, apparently the extension councils are working right now and have an earlier deadline even than the law board that reports their budgets to the county commission. So it, there needs to be some cleanup legislation to speak to some of those issues because the intent here is that the entity who has the responsibility and the final authority to approve a budget is giving the notice to the folks to participate in a public hearing so if they show up and talk about it that body can make a difference well in the law board's case they're going to approve the budget back in July but according to that statute before before July um, or in July second week of July I believe it is um, and then they're going to pass those on to the city and the county to approve Who's going to hold a public hearing that can do nothing to change that that budget? So, if if you're going to be in the principle of the legislation, realistically, the law board should follow these guidelines. But it's going to be very difficult for them to do this year, I think. Uh, I mean, they could issue a similar type notice that we're going to issue um, as to you know what that neutral rate might be, but they're not. I don't believe the legislation requires them to do it. Aren't so, there other yes. entities besides the law board that are caught in this? I think there are uh, some Around special districts. Well, you said extension, they are districts. I don't. I just mean I think we're, that the law board is not the only one. It would have been nice if uh, <clears throat> in the legislation they would have uh, gave yeah. some overarching sure. that there, if there are statutes in conflict with this, then those should be adjusted accordingly, but okay. they didn't do that. So you bet. that would be something for a future legislative item, though, for sure. 
Okay, I just thought, and that's uh, almost 16 to 18 million dollars. Yep, um, and most of our property tax. Yeah, so I, I was just, I, I think we're the, probably the only um, police enforcement, the po police department that has that kind of structure, so the others might be different uh, because they report right to their city managers, so it would fall in under one of their departments. Um, uh, I don't know if, if we can make a request. Uh, maybe it's too late for something like that because the, it'll already be decided and we're still kind of going to be putting our puzzle together, but most of it probably will be done by then is what I'm thinking. Uh, either way, uh, a discussion for future or if that has not already been established, maybe there's still a little gap gap where we can still put something in. Before. Well, I think it would be fairly easy for the law board to do when they publish their budget is to adopt some of the language in here as to what that rev they could compute what that revenue neutral rate is uh, and show that in their publication like we will have to do. And at least they would ever their advertisement for their public hearing would show that information uh, as of which it hasn't done in the past. And, and would have effect on folks being able to, to p come to that meeting and affect that change if they want to. So I think we could communicate that okay. to the law board. That, that'd be our preference versus us holding a public hearing on something we have no ability to change. Right. If somebody shows up to talk about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we, you wanna do the demo? Yeah. So we, we did uh, on your, when you open the, uh, your packet for your mail folder, your electronic mail folder, we've added some things that hopefully will make it more convenient for you to access some of the documents. And we just wanted to kind of run through and, and show you that. Uh, mainly the, so we've, when you get our, our, our email, the link to access the mail folder, uh, this comes up. And so we've added this Manhattan Development Code there. <clears throat> so that's the link to the actual code document. And then this is the, the schedule below it. And we have made it a change on that. I mentioned that 629 change in the schedule. We moved that to 76. So that's where that is. And uh, then we've also added the Crossroads Manhattan link to the right. So you can see the strategic plan website and have a quick access to that. So if there are other things that would be helpful for this, uh, you know, whether it's some, an RFP we have out or whatever the case may be that would be handy for you to have it a quick link to, let us know about that and we're happy to, to look at adding that here because it's something you're visiting at least twice a week. That makes sense? And, yeah. Okay. That would be great, actually. Okay. Thanks, Jared. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say this is Commissioner Reddy. On some of those invitations uh, for the chamber or even um, intergovernmental or, or other luncheons, uh, even though I push submit yes and I submit, I'm not always getting the link. I'm having to do it individually uh, on that day sometimes. So I don't know if, uh, if Brenda or who else is getting that notice that I've said yes. I don't get... <clears throat> anything indicating that I've responded and there isn't a link to it. So I've been caught off guard several times, but I will go in five minutes and can't find my link, but then I would have to send it to the original organizer, such as Sharla. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else has that problem or it's just me. We had it today. <laughs> 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 but this was, it was mainly because they rescheduled the meeting and, and so because the original message was use the original prior link. Well, we'd all wipe that off of our calendars and didn't carry it forward. So that was kind of bad, but they did send a reminder yesterday with a new link. So that was, that was good. Usually if you're registered, the person who's registered gets a, a, a confirmation email that says you're registered and here's the link. So, and if we registered that for you, then we should be forwarding that to you. So we'll, we'll look at that. As for that one, it's okay. But for the intergovernmental, for example, I'll click yes, and then I try to get in like at 11.55, and <laughs> all of a sudden I can't find it anymore. I'm texting yeah. Linda, where's the link, and all of this. Well, maybe that's something we can put there, too, <clears throat> as a fail-safe, as yeah. some of the links to some of those Zoom meetings. That would be a Zoom good idea. Meetings. That would be good. 
Thank don't you. know how long some of the Zoom meetings will keep going. Sure. Obviously, when that'll when we get back to in person, that'll that'll help for sure. Uh, one of the things Mark just mentioned is that once we accept a meeting, it disappears, and there was a link on it. Mm. And so, I mean, I'm sure it happens to all of you in this system, uh, but that that also accounts for the disappearing links. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. We'll, <coughs> we'll, we'll try to it's just one, do some massage work on that. Check yours and see if yours does that. Yeah. Sometimes we aren't in the same Okay. And uh, when you accept a, a calendar invite, that automatically jumps to your actual calendar within the webmail. So then you go to that date and time and double click on the event and then that'll bring up the link and all the meeting details for you. That's the way it's supposed to work anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, you know, I, you've asked us to bring forward discussion on the public art policy. So that's coming. Um, one of the things that, so there's, there's kind of three areas that, that we've kind of been tasked with. One, one area is the city's own policy of a 1% or some percent towards public art on projects. And is that, you know, so defining that, is that on every project? Is it on every project over $500,000, over a million dollars? Is it a building project as opposed to a street project? you know, or a sewer project. I mean, it's just kind of defining what those kind of projects are. Uh, and, and does location matter? I, you know, those are all those issues we're kind of working through on that. Uh, a second area is just a, what are the rules for uh, temporary or permanent art on public right of way? Uh, and that's that clearly we've been working through. And then probably the biggest component of that is, you know, uh, the, the staffing element because you know it, it, there's going to have to be a public works is going to have to it's it's kind of like a utility locate <laughs> you gotta only it's expanded because there's a legal aspect for agreements uh, there's the actual approving the location uh, and I'm sure I'm missing something there's there's but there's a lot of framework for that and then uh, how much do you want to control private art uh, obviously we haven't had much in impact at all downtown on the wonderful murals that are going on the private buildings on the alleys and stuff so uh, that's all been initiated privately and you know sh i'm not saying it should i'm just asking the question is that something that should be in the in the development code uh, as you know is this okay to do anywhere any neighborhood or is it should it be limited to certain areas uh, so those are just some things to think about complicated issue we have looked at other jurisdictions and what they're doing, so we have models to follow. So uh, we're looking at bringing that forward uh, uh, here in the next month or two. So trying and to get that. I just see that we're behind the curve and these issues are popping up so, and we're never gonna catch up. So I don't wanna hold up the policy for the Art and Humanities Committee and the, what they're trying to do while we solve all of these questions that will never be answered. <laughs> and we may have to segment those policies then That's so that, that, like that if do. we pursue yes. what the demand is and where the money is and we try to finalize that chapter, yeah. maybe that's what we should do. And then we bring the others along as they, be, they have more, uh, work, more items worked out. I think we have to. Okay. Uh, just that, that's I think there's another mural in the works. <clears throat> That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you for your said, time. I'd, ag I'd agree with that. Care. Like like the first one you had on the list ought, ought to really be the last on trying to you know dedicate a percentage of every project we do. That that's not what we were thinking about when we said you know go to work on this. It was we wanted a quick mechanism to take the grant money from the community foundation and get it to the arts board so they could bring forth projects. And and I guess right now if we could just do that, they could bring each project here and we could you know vote on it rather than try to nail down all the specifics on where you can paint, you know, where you can put it and who's going to maintain it. I mean, if we at least do that quickly, then you could wade through the rest of this as time permits. But I think that was our intent, was to try to get the money into their hands so they can say, okay, we want to do X, and then they can bring that to the commission, and we can say, okay, or no. That's that a make sense? That's a great idea. The city commission is faster than the policy. 
<laughs> we just want some art to replace what's going to disappear on Third Street this summer. Well, we usually don't like to draft policy every meeting. <laughs> I know. So but this that's that's the goal, over. and and then the the other implications are 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 the staffing elements uh, in that process, and we've got to figure that out. And right now, that's a challenge for us. So I'm happy to see the revenue increasing. And it, if we can have revenue to help with staff, that'd be great. <laughs> and that could be part of it with a grant. Like, you know, if they, they got a proposal, so we got X amount of money. Well, what's it cost for city staff part of it and have them pay for it? I mean, I, nothing wrong with that. What's the estimate to install it? I don't, I mean, that isn't exorbitant, you know. They're all unique. <laughs> it all, you know, uh, 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 Three-foot sculpture is different than a 30-foot sculpture. Some of these people are willing to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. <clears throat> Appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Sure. Can I go, Wynn? Wynn? Can, sure, I, can I go? Okay. Uh, Yesterday afternoon, I attended a meeting of the Parks uh, and Recreation Advisory Board, and it was very informative. I uh, <clears throat> appreciated um, their having the, uh, of course, we know about the Anthony Middle School ribbon cutting and uh, open house on May 21st and 22nd. But the chairman of the Park and Recreation Board has challenged the city commission. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of the Parks and Rec Board <clears throat> to a hoops contest to shoot basketball. So if we, I assume most of us are going to be there anyway, so I don't know that it would take 15, 20 minutes or how long. When are you ready, willing to ho shoot hoops at the uh, Anthony uh, dedication, open ha uh, what is it? Oh, ribbon cutting on the 21st? The whole city commission versus the whole parks and rec board. Uh, I think that's the challenge. <laughs> slam dunk contest. Yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> pretty much slam dunk. Uh, people are encouraged to go into Civic Rec, which is the system on the city's website, to set up an account to uh, so that they can um, register and be known to the recreation uh, these about for these new gyms and for other programs. Um, the uh, Flint Hills Discovery Center uh, selection committee that I'm serving on for Kidscape is just getting underway now. The RFP is officially due May 14th, so we're going to be convening and, and doing interviews. Um, and the Expedition Asia is expected to open at the Z uh, Sunset Zoo in mid-October. Um, and they have, uh, their trust is, has contributed $2.3 million to make that happen. Uh, there's, um, their budget is being cut by about $500,000. So there are things that they are not going to be able to do, and they had a list of what those things are. Uh, of course, we know about the Seco closing, Seco Park, uh, Seco pool closing, um, and uh, but Arts in the Park, uh, they've uh, there's been some additional money contributed, and they're going to be at 100% funding. So they're moving to get Arts in the Park scheduled. Um, we're renting out our turf soccer fields to the private clubs here in town. And so there is no youth soccer, as I understand it, for through the city. Uh, the, uh, they're set at, the Flint Hills Discovery Center is setting up a hands-on Harley Davidson experience for kids uh, coming up. And then this coming uh, Saturday, is the Native Stone Scenic Byways. And it's a self-guided tour that uh, you can get information on at the Flint Hills Discovery Center. And it meanders through the area south and east of here and all of the limestone 
fences and buildings. Um, and today, this morning, bright and early, was the, uh, the Commission for Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, CALEA, uh, presented recognition to the Riley County Police Department on their 30th year of accreditation and uh, announced the renewal of their accreditation for the next four years. Um, and uh, the uh, CALEA has also uh, <coughs> just finished a review of 25% of RCPD's policies uh, and they look at 25% every year and so they're going to start moving those through the law board for approval. Most of them are pretty technical police kinds of, of policies. Uh, but I think it's an indication that we are recognized for our level of professionalism in that organization. Uh, the state of Kansas has started a housing study uh, to help guide future housing development in the state. There's not been a need, housing needs assessment in Kansas for 30 years. And so they're going to have public, a public uh, meeting about that here in Manhattan on May 18th. I don't have the time, but I actually think that the city should have a vested interest in making some kind of a presentation to them. Um, and uh, I read an article in the Marysville paper about the Kansas-Nebraska Heritage Area Partnership. Kansas-Nebraska Heritage Area Partnership. And there are like 40 counties total between Kansas and Nebraska in this group. And they're trying to get, kind of get them together and coordinate um, and get people to cooperate willingly if you want to volunteer to participate. But it's all of the tourism sites in those, all those counties so they can uh, market to each other, I guess. Is, well, I think it's, I've got a clip in here that would be of interest. The Flint Hills uh, Regional Council, uh, EPA Brownfields Project, it's an EPA grant. They have, there have been, 95 sites have been identified in the seven regional council counties. And not all of them are uh, being worked. So, but there is, there are, there's one here in, uh, two here in Manhattan. Uh, the Plaza West has, um, they're, take, they're looking at, and then there are some uh, in the east side too, but it, they're not, they're just commercial only and if the owner volunteers and is interested. And some, some owners want to have their property evaluated because they have plans and they've got to get that kind of a, of a review conducted. Um, but these are contaminated sites, are all they are. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I know uh, I sat in on the Chamber's Legislative Forum last week, and um, uh, the legislators were talking about just trying to deal with the big issues. And one of the ones that was mentioned was the silting at Tuttle Creek and it has a price tag of $850,000. And supposedly there's some new technology, and I just haven't heard anything about that. Uh, if anybody knows something, why bring it to us so we can share. Um, but um, this housing study was mentioned again. Anyway, um, <coughs> let's see. I did see an article in the Topeka paper that the country stampede is go in Topeka for this uh, year. And, uh, <coughs> but they're talking about they won't be running into mud because it's all paved. <laughs> Remember that old runway? <laughs> There's no dirt to be found. Um, McCain <coughs> is, uh, has a pandemic film about local Dr. Steve Short and his experiences in New York 
It's called A Journey of a Frontline Warrior, a conversation with Dr. Steve Short. Anyway, you can, you can uh, look on the McCain, McCain at ksu.edu website to find it. And it's free. It's, it's like a documentary. So that's all. Yeah, we got a, we've got one item on the consent agenda where we're going to need a commissioner to serve <coughs> on the steering committee for the master food system plan. Consent item I. Is anyone interested in doing that? Aaron, you'd like to do that? Okay. We'll put your name in there for that. I forgot to <coughs> mention that earlier. So, Mark? Um, this afternoon, uh, MATC had their accreditation hearing and kind of filled in on that. That seemed like a good thing. Uh, they saw Jim posted not too long ago that they're through that process and it was good to hear all the collaboration MATC is doing uh, across the community. But uh, that's the only thing I'll add. So my, um, I do just set a date for the uh, RFP review for the Aggieville parking lot. I think it's going to be in two weeks right before the uh, city commission meeting. Is that right? It's uh, the, the RFPs for the parking lot behind Kites or to yeah. the south of Kites. They're yeah, supposed to, fast. yeah, we're going to have a selection <laughs> committee. We'll meet that day. They've got a date set at least now. Yeah, May 18th, 4 o'clock. So Kristen just sent that email out this afternoon. May 18th at 4 o'clock is going to work. Yes. Um, the uh, community and K-State uh, we're meeting every other week regarding uh, any COVID related issues. Um, I think most of you are well aware of uh, the percentages. It, it varies everything from 25% to 45% as far as uh, in, um, vaccines uh, in our community. A lot of people that, not a lot, but several folks that have gotten their first, first dose here may end up getting their second dose elsewhere because there's always a few left over. And um, I think now they used to have it at Potteroff, now it's back at the health department for vaccines. Everything's pretty stable. Uh, last time we spoke, there was one person positive uh, at Via Christi. Um, for graduation, I think there's still going to be a face mask requirement for graduation through summer uh, for K-State. Um, President Meyer said we need to work towards building that herd immunity via vaccines and to continue to work on those things. And I think that's what we are all working on. I think the first shot uh, is not as bad, but some people have the fear of the second one because of everything they're hearing about symptoms uh, they might get and might need to take a day off or even a few days off of work. And it needs to be uh, set at least given appropriate information in the sense that there are folks that may uh, have uh, different types of symptoms but most of them have about a 24-hour period of symptoms, uh, maybe some aches and pains or maybe a fever, and then in about 24 hours, uh, they're back to normal. So just we need to get to four, uh, at least 60 to 70 percent for herd immunity. And uh, the national stats are almost, the experts are almost saying we're probably not going to get to herd immunity, but it's very important. And this is, uh, you know, I have a lot of relatives back home in India, and in my village there's people dying uh, just right at their homes. The hospitals are filled to capacity. Um, there's oxygen tanks and all of this that are being sent to India. But unfortunately, we don't have hospitals in our villages, like our rural areas, even in the United States. So it's not getting to them. And um, so there, it is pretty dramatic. And uh, I hope in the United States we take uh, advantage of the medications, the science, and the vaccines that we have available to us. With that said, I also attended the legislative forum by our legislators, so I'm not going to repeat all of that information. I will look to uh, Dennis and uh, Jared, hopefully we get around <laughs> that far. If we don't, just some notes about where we are with the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Task Force, uh, just some notes, uh, uh, updates on that, as well as with Crossroads. I'm trying to do my part, kicking it out as many areas as possible to have more people be engaged towards our strategic plan and make sure we're getting all, all of the, um, as many people as possible engaged in the process. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. 
Should we take a break here before the meeting? Well, only thing I had was a reminder on May 6th, we're having our Let's Meet at the Crossroads public engagement events for the second round of the strategic plan. We're going to be uh, on campus from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. trying to intercept some students at K-State and uh, get their opinions and feedback, as well as we have the Man Happy Hour downtown event on points at the platforms there from 4.30 to 6 p.m., and then a barbecue and ice cream social at the Weefall Pavilion in City Park from 7 to 9 p.m. So hopefully uh, we can get a lot of folks out there to join, and then if you can't uh, make it or if you want to participate virtually, we're having a virtual public meeting over the noon hour on Monday, May 10th. Thanks. And for an um, update from Dennis Marshall, Assistant City Manager, we do have the Recovery Task Force meeting next Thursday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It will be um, virtual. There is conversation about winding down the Recovery Task Force, so we'll have some more information as we talk to the members about that. Potentially, this could be the last meeting in May and then maybe winding down one more in June. Um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force met last month. They have now begun in earnest to work in their kind of five subcommittees, five focus groups. Their next meeting will be May 20th. It will be at 6 p.m. at the Kansas State University Student Union. It will be their second in-person meeting, so there will not be a video opportunity, but public is certainly invited and will be um, encouraged to come and they will continue to work in their breakout five group subcommittee kind of drilling down and ultimately each subgroup is talking about e economic vitality, health and well-being and some different facets about how they can make recommendations to the city commission. And so they're on their track. They've met four times. This will be their fifth meeting in May and they're working towards a report out with recommendations for you by the end of December 2021. Where is it in the union? The ballroom on the third ballroom, floor, the Kansas okay. City Student Union Ballroom on sure. the third floor, 6 okay. p.m., May 20th. Right, thank you. All right, that gives us about a two minute break here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. 
Can you say that again? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry, just making sure I can hear you over the speakers. Thanks. Okay, yep, yeah, no problem. about ready to get started here so if we can take your seat we'll okay we're about a minute uh, about a minute past time those of you out there watching on uh, the various video feeds welcome to the City Commission meeting for Tuesday May 4th and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance have a proclamation on the agenda for this evening, which is uh, Mental Health Month for May 2021, and I believe uh, Robin Cole, you're here to, if you want to come forward and say a few words, and also uh, Doncia McDonald, if you, if you want to say a couple things about it before we read the proclamation, uh, come on forward and use that microphone there, I think it works. First of all, I'd like to introduce Doncha McDonald. Does it, is it working? I probably have to just stand right in front of it. There we go. <laughs> so Doncha McDonald is on our governing board, and so is Stan Wilson. Uh, would you like to say something first? Oh, I just want to say, in light of how stigmatized, especially serious mental illnesses, how much this means to us as a community that our community is acknowledging the need and we have been a very successful community. We have CIT for the police officers, which is training for people with mental health. We have co-responders, which is therapists going out and we have the much needed crisis stabilization, new crisis stabilization unit at Pawnee and I'm just happy to be part of this community and thank you for doing this proclamation. Well, I would just like to second what Don just said, and I think we're all lucky that we live in a town like Manhattan that can support people with mental illness. Thank you. You know, before, uh, before the pandemic, we knew in this country that one in five adults um, in any given year would have symptoms of a mental illness. And then in a lifetime, approximately 46% of all Americans would have a diagnosable mental illness. And about half of those would develop symptoms before the age of 14. The, the pandemic has uh, seen an increase in anxiety, depression, and it's especially hit young people uh, hard. At Pawnee, what we saw on the front end, so a year ago, was that when the stay-at-home orders were in place, the number of people reaching out for services truly plummeted. And that was in spite of the fact that we offered services through telehealth. Uh, people just hunkered down and didn't reach out for the routine care that they needed. 
Consequently, as we got into the year, what we saw was an escalation in the number of people showing up at the CSU in crisis, requesting crisis screens, needing to be admitted to the CSU, or being admitted for hospitalization outside of our community. Uh, now that we're more than a year into it, we're seeing people start to relax. Um, they are more comfortable reaching out again for services. We're still providing the option of telehealth, and that will be true probably through the end of the year. The director of KDHE has said that um, Medicaid in particular will likely uh, continue to authorize telehealth until the United States uh, public health emergency expires. And we're not expecting to see um, at the federal level uh, any expiration of that public health emergency during 2021, probably not until the end of the year. And so what we're seeing now is the number of people reaching out for services is exceeding what the volume was before the public health emergency was declared. And so at Pawnee, we're having to look at um, creative ways to try to respond to the need because in the same way that people are finally acknowledging that they're overwhelmed, we're seeing an overwhelming number of people reach out for care. So this month's mental health, or this year's mental health theme is tools to thrive. Uh, those are tips for how to maintain your mental health or improve your mental health. They will be available on our website on our Facebook page, and they're also available through Mental Health America, which is the national driver of Mental Health Month. So I express my thanks to you for declaring May as Mental Health Month. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being. Prevention works, treatment is effective, and people do recover. Each business, school, government agency, health care provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental health problems and has a role in promoting and supporting mental health efforts. All Americans face challenges in life that can impact their mental health, especially during a pandemic. Now, therefore, Wynn Butler, Mayor of the City of Manhattan, Kansas, do we hereby proclaim May 2021 as Mental Health Month in Manhattan and call upon the businesses, schools, government agencies, healthcare providers, organizations, and citizens of the city of Manhattan to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, its relationship to a strong, vibrant community, the steps our citizens can take to protect their mental health, and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental health conditions. Okay, appreciate everything you do at, at Pawnee Mental Health Service and you know all of you keep up the good work and hopefully you're getting sufficient funding from you know various sources and donations and things of that nature. So so excellent. Appreciate you being here tonight. Okay, this is the uh, first meeting of the month, so we have open public comments. I didn't receive any uh, you know by email. Uh, as of 4 p.m. today. Is there anyone present in the audience that wishes to make a comment? This would be on anything that is not on the current agenda, consent agenda or regular agenda. So if you, if you wish to make a comment, please come up, limit your time to five minutes, and please state your name and address. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Tracy Anderson. I live at 116 E.J. Frick Drive. And I would like to discuss or talk to you tonight about the need for an indoor aquatic facility in Manhattan. Um, you should have received a letter and proposal in your packet uh, last night, I believe. And I'm really wearing three hats here tonight. I am a 30 plus year triathlete. Uh, so swimming is a key part of what my favorite hobby is. Uh, and I cannot do that right now. Uh, I spent all of my time in the natatorium swimming for those last 30 plus years. Um, 
I'm also a business owner in town and believe in the quality of life in Manhattan and uh, the need for us to have the amenities to attract young families, retirees, et cetera, to our community and have those quality of life amenities that the Parks and Rec Department provides. I'm also, from a business end, willing to put my own skin in the game to pursue a feasibility study for the Aquatic Center. So I'm gonna back up to 2014 when the city um, embarked on a study, the Strategic Facility Improvement Plan study uh, with RDG and my own company uh, together. And that study was completed in 2015. And <clears throat> the result of that at that point in time was that 47% 40 of households identified a need for an indoor aquatic facility. 34% uh, of households indicated less than 50% of their needs were being met uh, from an indoor aquatic facility. 37% of households indicated 0% of their needs were being met. And 41% of households indicated they would utilize an indoor aquatic facility. Um, that was done in 2015, way prior to the natatorium being permanently closed. I can only imagine those percentages increasing at this point in time. So I would like you to consider moving forward with a feasibility study for an indoor aquatic center as presented to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments on any topic that is not on the current agenda or consent agenda? Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for your service and the many issues that you were involved in. My name is Chris Spooner. I live at 1527 Humboldt, and I would ask you to uh, favorably consider the feasibility study that, that Tracy talked about. We've lived in Manhattan seven years now. Uh, both my daughters have graduated from Manhattan High School and have left this community for a while. Uh, some of my fondest memories as a father were spending time with them uh, Saturday morning at the indoor pool and the other communities that we lived in. It's an, it was an important asset in the many communities that we have lived in as they grew up. And I know that uh, as Tracy referenced the uh, absence of that space there are others in the, in the community that would certainly benefit from a access to a public indoor water facility. So I ask you to favorably consider the feasibility and we stand ready to help and assist with that uh, plan and, and the, uh, the further activities afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Just come forward, remember to state your name and address. Yes, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, City Commissioners. My name is John Ballman and I reside at 3111 Harahay Ridge here in town. I'm a resident and a homeowner here in Manhattan and I'm proud to say that all six of my children are products of the public school system here in Manhattan as well as all of the opportunities that this community has provided and continues to provide. I thank the commission for reviewing the quality of life study which identified an indoor aquatic center as the next community need to be addressed and I thank you for considering this request for the feasibility study on how to meet that need. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for your service. I don't often get to say that uh, in my role when I'm talking with you about rezonings or floodplain management issues. Um, I'm also with the aquatics group. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to uh, move on with the feasibility, feasibility study that, that Tracy um, has been working on with our group. My two sons are avid swimmers. Uh, they're both on the local swim team. My oldest uh, has found a spot uh, on the high school swim team and has truly enjoyed that. Um, but they're not just swimmers that like walk, uh, swimming over a black line back and forth, back and forth. We truly enjoy swimming aquatics as a uh, as a, just a recreational activity going down slides and um, wrestling and roughhousing in, in pools. And we've done that um, ever since I've been a dad for my boys and with my wife. So um, it is a, a family 
bond with us. It's also a community um, attractor, I think, for Manhattan. When my son's uh, going to the community and someone asks what they do for a sport or whatnot, and they say swimming, 100% of the time this last 14 months, everyone they talk to has said, it is a shame that Manhattan does not have an indoor pool. And our group hopes to remedy that with the first step of this feasibility study. So I know we can't approve it tonight, but I sure hope we uh, move on it quickly so we can find a solution and uh, get that going. So uh, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll close public comments. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Reddy. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the teachers, um, whether it's your regular pre-K to 12 or before and after school teachers, whatever level of educator you are. Thank you for all your work you're doing. Uh, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, and I just want to acknowledge all of the teachers in our community uh, for the tremendous year they've had last year and now coming back into this year as well. Uh, I had a couple of my kids visit last week, and um, we were all vaccinated, doing all things right. Uh, there were we were we did everything local, and it was just very impressive to see the platforms downtown, how vibrant our community is looking, and how active everybody is. And it was just uh, a very exciting and happy place to be. You know, taking walks and getting a cup of coffee or shopping in our local stores. We dined at our local restaurants, and uh, it's good to see everything coming back to a, a sense of normalcy, yet all of these uh, local facility, facilities still had the same precautions to make sure that we are still um, playing it safe until we are out of the woods. So I just wanted to thank everybody, our uh, local businesses, our um, community, for doing all things right in this during this uh, challenging period. Um, and I'm sure uh, Commissioner Morris is going to speak to RCPD accreditation. But congratulations to RCPD for 30 years of accreditation and for the work they do in our community. Commissioner Hattasol, are you interested in oh, making you. a comment? No? Uh, um, Commissioner Morris. Yes. Um, I would just, I, a couple of things actually. Uh, I. <clears throat> went to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting last night, and one of the more interesting <laughs> uh, is the chair of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board challenged the city commission to a hoops contest at the upcoming uh, uh, ribbon cutting of the Anthony uh, Recreation Center, and that'll be on May 21st. And uh, during the uh, briefing session earlier today, most of the commission, all the commissioners said that they'd be willing to participate, as I recall. So um, that might be interesting. <laughs> so that might be a way. To, um, the uh, they also provided the staff provided a list of those programs that are being reduced or eliminated. And I don't know. Uh, the arts and the park program is a go. Uh, it was the funding was reduced, but evidently some funding was found, and I don't know the details. But I'm delighted to have that happen. And I understand from Frank Trace that there's going to be a, a municipal band announcement soon, giving those dates. But I was it wasn't on the website yet when I saw it. Maybe it is now. But just and. Um, uh, Let's see. There, there's a, oh well, today, this morning, at the Riley County Police Department, um, a representative of the Commission for Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, the acronym is CALEA, presented RCPD with a 30 year uh, anniversary plaque for certification. And um, uh, RCPD was the first certified law enforcement um, program under that uh, and, and that's become a national standard and there are others now in Kansas still not a lot but still a dozen or you know something like that so 
uh, it's a it's a pretty big deal for because it, it's uh, it's like university reaccreditation or every reaccreditation. It means that you're working hard and you're examining your own policies and you're not letting policies sit there for 15 years without being updated. So it's a good thing to do. And um, so I'm, uh, let's see. Uh, every year this CALEA organization reviews 25% of RCPD's policies. So within a four-year period, they've looked at all of them and made recommendations. And then the director will start bringing those policy changes when they can get them put together and back to the law board for approval. Um, I'm serving on the Kidscape Selection Committee from the Flint Hills Discovery Center. And that's, uh, the, the proposals are due on May 14th, so we're going to get that underway. Um, I uh, wanted to mention that the uh, state of Kansas is initiating a housing study. And there hasn't been one, it's called a housing needs assessment. And there hasn't been one for 30 years. And so I'm enthusiastic about that. They're going to be in Salina and Manhattan. Uh, April 20, well, April 29th is over, Salina. But May 18th, the, uh, which is coming up, they'll be in Manhattan. And uh, so anyone with an interest in housing, and I would hope affordable housing, should be uh, providing some input to them. Uh, the other thing I just think, I, it's in the paper, but I know a lot of people don't take the paper necessarily, but McCain Auditorium is hosting a featuring a pandemic film and a local doctor, Steve Short, and his experiences during the pandemic in New York. And um, it says the, there are two films, actually, but they will be on May 7th, so coming right up at 7.30. And just go to the McCain website. McCain, uh, let's see, give us it here. Um, McCain at ksu.edu and uh, get more information on it. But I been curious about his experience and it'll be different than just reading in the newspaper about it. It'd be great to hear his commentary, I think. Um, and that's all. I just wanted to mention those things. Thank you. Mayor, I was going to... I just realized, uh, I guess, uh, Commissioner Reddy had mentioned it, but um, this is probably, this is our last meeting before school's completely out. And just kind of reflecting on the uh, year that at the edu we're such an education-minded community with the university, with our uh, local school districts, uh, it's been such a incredible year for young families, for teachers, for students. Um, difficult challenges, and it's coming to an end. Hopefully, we don't have to ever do this again like this uh, in this format, but just wanted to also thank the educators and the parents and the teachers and the community because so much of that is, is what drives this city. Um, so again, thank you to those educators and, and everyone involved to getting us through this year. Okay, and I just want to add my congratulations to the Rowley County Police Department on that accreditation. I attended the ceremony this morning and um, it's it's really a, a great honor to see RCBD do that. You know, 30 years. That's just uh, just incredible. So we'll move on now to uh, the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda are those of a routine and housekeeping nature. Are those items which have previously been reviewed by the city commission, and a commissioner may request that it might be moved to the end of the general agenda. I, I want to mention that at our coordination meeting, we talked a little bit about consent item I which is master food system plan. And we needed to uh, get a commissioner to volunteer to serve on the steering committee and Commissioner Aaron Esterbrook uh, did that. So uh, as part of consent item I, uh, Commissioner Esterbrook will be the commissioner appointed to serve on the steering committee for the master food systems plan. So any comments from commissioners on the consent agenda? Yes, um, I don't have any issues with the consent agenda. But I did want to look at item C uh, for the Aggieville event uh, for June 11th through the 13th. Um, 
Originally, the dates were kind of messed up, but I'm glad that's all straightened out with the ordinance and such for the uh, beer gardens. But I think this is just a, um, a really good event for Manhattan High School alumni that have been all over the place, and hopefully they can come visit our community again. Three-day event, very well planned. Uh, I looked at all their agenda stuff, and it might be a little um, iffy because of the precautions that might still be in place, but I think it's, um, and I'm glad they're doing it outdoors as far as the beer gardens so that there isn't as much crowding in indoor spaces. That's what made the platforms outside really nice and uh, to have people outside and still socialize. So hopefully it's a good turnout. Uh, wish you all the best of luck. And um, hopefully next year it'll be back to normal. But I, d I did have some issues at the beginning because it said 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. as far as serving beer. So I'm glad those modifications were made as was originally intended, so for, except for the error. So thank you. Okay, any other comments on the consent agenda? None? Okay, now we're open for public comments. Does anyone in the public wish to comment on a consent agenda item? Um, I would just say <clears throat> that as I read through the Aggieville proposal, I remembered that as the city commission specifically asked the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce to try to, to brainstorm and try to come up with some ideas for how we can uh, begin to replace the country stampede. And we know it's going to have to be smaller and uh, more frequent events because you don't just organize a stampede uh, in, you know, in a couple of months. But just to say that this is a good effort, I do worry that it would not be an open, you know, that the, it won't turn into another fake Patty's Day with a, by putting out the word far and wide. I view this as for the Manhattan High School graduates, and that is the most appropriate thing rather than sending it out on Facebook to the whole of the people who came come to some events, but. We'll see how it goes, and so I'm, encourage, I'm encouraged that we're doing new things because we have to do new things. So thank you, that's all. Yeah, I'll second. I think it's a great initiative from the Aggieville Business District to you know, change things up a little bit and have different events, and uh, we'll see how that goes with the alumni. I know my, my daughter's 40 years old now, and she's, of course, a graduate from Manhattan High, and so it'll be interesting. Uh, that'll be a different crowd than the fake Patty's Day crowd <laughs> when they come in for sure. So if there's no other uh, comments on the consent agenda, can we get a motion? Sure. Mayor, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Commissioner Reddy, second. Okay. Uh, City Clerk, Brenda Wolf, can you please call the roll? Mayor Butler? Yes. Commissioner Morse? Yes. Commissioner Hattesel? Yes. Commissioner Estabrook? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, then we'll move on to item six, which is public hearing to consider the 2021 Community Development Block Grant Annual Action Plan. And we have a couple of presenters here, and I see Eric, you're already there, ready to go. Yes, good evening. Eric Cattell, Director of Community Development. Tonight is the public hearing on our 2021 annual action plan for our CDBG program. Um, I'm going to give just a brief overview of the broader program and then we'll drill down into the action plan itself. As you know, HUD is the um, keeper of the CDBG program nationally and our local efforts also have to support the national goals, which is to target low and moderate income families and communities. Um, national objectives is to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing and suitable living environments, and also to provide expanded economic opportunities. Um, national, obje or national goals are to improve availability and accessibility of various types of services and infrastructure, um, facilities, and housing, provide affordability through repair and creation of housing, and also sustain uh, livable and viable communities. As you know, Manhattan's been an entitlement community since 2010, which means we get 
an allocation directly from HUD every year. We don't have to compete through the state um, as we used to before 2010. And again, the, our allocations are principally to benefit lower and moderate income neighborhoods and families within our community. And we get an annual allocation. This is what we mean by low and moderate income. Um, this is based on the, the latest data from HUD. Um, and it's dependent on household size as to what 80% of low uh, medium family income is. And we use this for qualifying people, particularly for our um, housing rehab program. These neighborhoods that are shown in kind of the light red color are the, are the neighborhoods within Manhattan. Um, census tracts that are 51% or more of the population in those areas are at or below that 80% median income. City limits are the yellow lines. Um, it, it doesn't mean that our programs don't go outside of these other areas. In fact, as I just said, our housing rehab program anywhere in the city, if the owner qualifies income-wise, we can, we can assist them. Also, a lot of our projects involve public infrastructure, ADA improvements, sidewalk improvements. Those automatically qualify anywhere in the city if there are ADA improvements. And other types of things, the, um, infrastructure for senior citizens and, and special needs types of populations automatically qualify as well. This is a list of the things we've done over the past 11 years. Um, the, and these four underlined categories are basically the, the program areas that we use CDBG for. Obviously program administration, which um, pays for our grant administrator and, and taking care of the program, all of our fair housing activities and our housing rehab program. Since 2010, we've done over 100 single family um, rehabs in town. Um, we deal with social service agencies that again deal with all kinds of issues for helping low and moderate income people within the community and, and children and seniors. And then under community facilities and infrastructure, this is just a, a partial list of what we've done over the past 11 years. Every, everything from HVA system, HVAC systems at the crisis center, a lot of Douglas Center improvements, um, the new kitchen at the uh, senior center, uh, Longs Park, pretty much all of those improvements that were done a few years back were done through CDBG. Um, City Park, we've been going around. In fact, this later this year, you'll see the, the final phase of the perimeter sidewalk trail um, up 11th Street will be done this year through CDBG. As an entitlement community, we're required to do a consolidated plan, which includes a, a number of other documents, our citizen participation plan, the five-year strategic plan, the action plan, which we'll talk about tonight in our fair housing study. Um, the citizen participation plan, as the name implies, it outlines how we involve citizenry within um, our, our CDBG program and how we involve their comments and um, creating the, what we decide we're going to do with our allotments. Um, we did the analysis of impediments to, for fair housing uh, last year. And again, citizen comments and suggestions are part of it. Um, various maps and federal forms are obviously parts of it. The five-year strategic plan we just updated last year um, for 2020 through 2024. And then we amended it twice, once in July and once in November to recognize and incorporate our two CARES Act allotments that we got. Um, our goals, five, five main goal areas for our strategic plan. Again, this is to sustain affordable housing opportunities, improve livability and safety of neighborhoods, support community facilities, um, again, to improve quality of life for low and modern income residents and neighborhoods, support public services, um, and again, that's our social service agencies, essentially, and then support activities that can create and sustain quality jobs. So the annual action plan is for a specific year. Um, and so the program year for 2021 starts in July and ends next June. Um, the action plan lays out specifically how we're going to spend the money in our, our four program areas. 
And as I said, it, it's based on input from residents and our local agencies and city departments. Um, it included a request for proposals last fall to the social service agencies. And uh, the allocation that we got this year is, is a bit less. Um, as you can see, over the past five or six years, um, we've been as high as 660,000. This past last year, or this, this allotment is 534,000, and that's a formula based on poverty levels, um, income levels, rental rates, and other information that, that um, HUD uses to create our allocation. The timeline for um, how we got to tonight, um, again, last fall, we were consulting with the public and the social service agencies. Um, we did an RFP for the agencies, and they submitted those in December. They were reviewed by the Social Service Advisory Board, and they helped prioritize um, allocations to our, our agencies. February through April, had um, well, in March, they announced our allocation, and then we worked with the departments and city manager's office to finalize the draft annual action plan for 2021. March through April, we've we just completed our 30-day public review period. Tonight is the public hearing that you'll hold here in a minute. And again, the, the action plan, plan year starts on July 1st. So more specifically, the annual action plan for 2021, we have program administration, which is limited to 20% of the allocation, housing rehabilitation, um, public services, which again is limited to 15% of the allocation, and public services and neighborhood infrastructure. So specifically for this year, under administration and fair housing, um, we're allocating 106,000, which is right at that 20%. This pays for our grant administrator. It pays for my time and my executive secretary's time that we're spending on CDBG activities. It's reimbursement to the city. It pays for, again, all of, the, all of the program administration. It also paid for the fair housing seminar that we do every year. Public services, um, we have the same five agencies that we typically have. Um, that we've allocated the full 15% allowed by HUD. And these are the agencies uh, that will be um, funded this year through CDBG. This is the regular CDBG money. Again, it's not CARES Act. This is just the, the regular funding. Housing rehabilitation is about 30% of the budget. Um, and again, this is where we work with low-income homeowners. They have to live in the house, and we'll help them rehab. We do radon abatement, lead abatement, asbestos abatement, um, lots of windows, new roofs, HVA systems, plumbing, electrical, anything that we can do to help them keep their house and, st and stay in their house and keep that house as part of our affordable housing stock. And it helps stabilize neighborhoods as well. Then our five, oh, um, the, the last item is the uh, public facilities and neighborhood infrastructure. And this year we're going to be redoing the 5th and Leavenworth intersection to uh, make it much more ADA friendly. It'll have bulb outs, some new pavement markings. It, have new stormwater infrastructure put in there as well. And we're combining um, 190,000 of this year's budget um, 2021 allocation with some leftover money from last year, some projects that we couldn't do to the pandemic. So the total project will be almost 300,000 to do that intersection. Um, 30-day review period was March 24th, April 23rd. It was advertised in the paper through all of our different social media platforms um, at the city and public library websites, as well as hard copy at the library. Um, the, the public could email uh, my grant administrator directly with comments. We spoke with all of our key agencies that we fund to get their input as well. Made a presentation to the planning board um, and the public um, can either come tonight in person or or register to uh, speak virtually during the public hearing. So the action tonight is to hold the public hearing and then authorize execution of um, all our applicable forms and agreements and, and sub-recipient agreements. 
So with that, uh, if there are any questions, I can try and answer them. And Christina is also online virtually if you have more detailed uh, questions. Yeah. Yes, Mark. Uh, Commissioner Hattesall here. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, since we're getting a dwindling amount of money from the feds from 630000 down to 500 something thousand, does that mean we're winning the war on poverty and low income somehow slightly? Or if it's based on income, rental stuff, and, or yeah, there's some main factor that's the main <coughs> outlier that's kicking us down the, the priority list for them? It's, it, well, it really starts with whatever allocation Congress creates through the budget, and then it's spread out to the states, and then from the states to each um, entitlement city. Who, so it's it? kind of a pecking order, but I guess to answer your question again, it's it's done through a formula that Grant, that HUD uses, and I mean, I, I don't know that you could say that we're winning the war on poverty necessarily. Um, I think as of last year, Chris was saying we're, Manhattan is almost at about 48, 49% poverty. So, yeah. and, and some of that is because we're a university town, and so there's a lot of people that are just part-time employees or whatever, and there's military and others, but. So is, is it like the whole federal allocation from HUD nationwide is going, has been going down too? Is that? That could be accurate? part of it, yes. Okay, all right. Also, I think, I mean, there it's maybe not totally related, but there is a lot of CARES Act money out there as well, so maybe that is another reason why it, it went down. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Yeah. This is, Linda Morris, this is just such a diminishing number uh, yeah. that <clears throat> it begs the question uh, whether that's just going to continue to go down incrementally, and that's what we see there. Oh, it's $100,000 in seven years. It's, de de you know, it's less. And it's been, and again, this <clears throat> is only showing you 2015, but the first years back, 2010, 2011, it was, it was, yeah. down in this level as well. So it's, it changes over the it years, around, depending on much. what Congress and the administration do. Yeah. So. Well, fortunately, we have some other money this time. I want to just raise the, <clears throat> is this the public hearing, or is this just our and This is our discussion. You'll, you'll need to open the public okay. hearing at, okay. at the appropriate time. Okay. Now? Okay. <clears throat> Do you recall when uh, I'm just, I'm just going to make an assumption here that this became a block grant chunk at some point? Is historically is there a beginning of that? I was just curious. Uh, community development got chunked into a block grant because just this conversation. I'm here. He, HUD is actually. Uh, issuing more funding than typical, it just may not be into this block grant at this uh, moment, and maybe that it's more targeted um, in other programs, but I'm just wondering when this all kind of began to get lumped together under community development block grant, if you have any idea. Um, I, I don't know the history behind that. So, so I, it, it happened with the it 2010 was, census? and we, that, That's when we became entitlement. Right. And we, and we didn't have to compete. We didn't have to submit an application to the state of Kansas every year to get CDBG money. And 2010 is when we became entitlement. So, so 2011, I think, was our first year of, of non-competitive entitlement funding. Yeah. And uh, that, that was based on the 2010 census. It also, uh, I, I think you're, and maybe Christina or Eric, but the pool of money that comes to the state. So if you, you continue to have more entitlement cities in your state, then that money gets spread amongst all of them. So that's part of what's going, potentially what's going on as well. I think we had a new city uh, go over 50,000 in the last couple, one anyway. And this is Chris. We did have a New city in Kansas last year. It was one of the reasons that during our uh, third, second amendment of the consolidated plan in November, we had to um, also decrease our allocation for the regular 2020 year. Um, um, because
because HUD had miscalculated the allocation to account for that new city, so everybody had to give back a few dollars. And it wasn't huge for us, um, but that was that, that is part of the case. But um, it's the money that Congress is giving to HUD overall, and HUD has several programs besides CDBG that it funds. And so it divvies up the funds they get from Congress amongst all those programs. And then each program divvies up the money for all of its um, beneficiaries, so to speak. I, I want to talk about the census tracts. Is it appropriate during this discussion period or during the public hearing? <clears throat> you can talk about it now if you want. Well, I don't know if it won't go into the public hearing record. If I, I, anyway, um, I have expressed disappointment in the past that the north major part of the Northview area <clears throat> is not included <clears throat> in this uh, um, category. And I know you said that you can get rehab money for homes if anywhere in the city, but some of these other programs are limited to just being in the census tract, right? Well, our, again, our rehab, and you're talking about this area here, which actually doesn't calculate to being 51% or more of a yeah. 80%, and this is this is held in the census. This isn't, isn't us making this map. So we have um, a But we, we can do <clears throat> rehab anywhere in the city. Again, our... ADA improvements we do anywhere in the city. Um, the social service agencies that we fund mm -hmm. um, income qualify their clients, but their clients can live anywhere in the city. And so how does are, the census tract make a difference? So if, how is Northview disadvantaged because it is not? If we were going to do, well, let's say we were, and we did back Back in Karen's era, we, yeah. we did some streets and water lines and that kind of stuff. Okay. And we would have to go out and actually canvas the neighborhood and ask them questions. We, yeah. I mean, it, it's not a comfortable survey. How much do you make? How much make? do you make? <laughs> and and yeah. that's one way you can do it, or you rely on the census yeah. track maps. So. so we have a chance with this new census information about to come out and with the redistricting process, we have a chance to have different census tracts in our uh, definitions in, for this program. Well, right? the, track, the track boundaries and the block groups yeah. probably won't change, but the data within them will change, and we'll find out, hopefully around um, October, they'll start releasing the, the city-level data. Um, so we'll, we'll know if any of, of these block groups or tracks change on this map. Well, I, I just uh, object to um, that, at least that southern part of the, of the Northview area not being included in the, nor in the low income definition, but that's just, that's my comment. <laughs> Thank you. This is Commissioner Reddy. I think yeah. you know the proposal you have in front of us. Uh, I'm comfortable with, but I we've spoken um, at least Commissioner Morris and I have at different occasions and even uh, with each other. How do you uh, categorize homelessness? Because if we just look at the uh, Manhattan Emergency Shelter as homelessness prevention, to me prevention means to stop it from happening. This is after it's happened and that's why they're ending up there. So that's one, one touch point about how to gauge it. I know, you know the USD 383 and other schools have the free and reduced, but that doesn't necessarily mean homeless. They're just in poverty, or, but they may still have a home. And then I don't know how they track it on a census. So if people actually went under the bridges or wherever these uh, little hot spots might be uh, to get that information. I know there's a reluctance uh, of a trust factor uh, with outsiders when it's the homeless community, um, you know, giving out their information or us ask all this uh, paperwork that's involved and filling out forms and such. So I don't know if we have a, a clear understanding of the homelessness population in our community. And I don't mean K-State students. 
that's a temporary, they're going to live here in their dorms, work part-time, and then move out. I'm talking about all of these other ones that are there for years, or even that are newly maybe got you know kicked out of a home or had to leave their home for some reason and may not have ended up at the crisis center or at the Manhattan Emergency Shelter. How do you pick up those numbers? Do we have an idea of who we can contact or how we can get a better understanding of our community? Well, working with our, again, with our social service agencies, some of, some of them listed here that deal with the truly homeless and be able as the new agency right. and there's some others um, that, that have a, a better handle on that. Um, Chris, do you want to talk about, I, HUD has their own definition of homeless and the school district has kind of its own definition and we, we try and work with all those definitions. Uh, MESI and the Crisis Center, when they're qualifying people, clients to serve through CDBG money, they're going to have to be using HUD's definition because it's CDBG money, but their, their budgets are, CDBG is, is not all of their budget, obviously. They have a lot of other pots of money to serve their clients. Yeah. Is there a, a national website or some kind of website that defines all of these uh, definitions for homelessness? Like you said, each, each government agency has their own indicator of what it is. Um, you know, when I, when I'm, when I was teaching, um, there might be three or four families in one house that they're homeless. That's why they ended up in their friend's house. Just because they're in somebody else's home doesn't mean they have a home. Right. So I don't know where to get all of that information. And that's probably not for this time, uh, for this conversation. But that would be um, something for good for us to know as we look at our budget, our needs, our community, to get a better understanding of that. And um, I, I just don't know where to go for that information. But these are all after the fact is what I'm seeing. And it's very appropriate for CDBG funds. And one of the things from the National League of Cities is it's always on the cutting block. CDBG funds are always on the cutting block. And it's so important to build those relationships with the national government agencies and our legislators to fight for that because that's often the thing that they let go because of all of these other um, lobbyists that are working on other special interest things. And CDBG funds are not always getting what they need. So th those are comments that probably have nothing to do with what we are actually having the public hearing for, but it felt appropriate at this time also. Thank you. Eric or Christina, can I ask a clarifying question on that homelessness prevention? Um, and I may be getting confused with the CARES part that came last year, because MISA did administer some funds that were to help with eviction and to prevent eviction and, and typically homelessness prevention would be if somebody's in arrears and they're facing eviction that would keep them and from becoming homeless so that would be before the homelessness but the rapid rehousing would be the the after the fact is this indicating are these funds here for the rapid rehousing portion of well, MISA? If, if I could weigh in, um, MISA actually has several different programs that they operate from the shelter. Yes, they are a homeless shelter, but they also do the homeless prevention program, which prevents people from coming into the shelter because they are um, pretty full all the time. And then this year they were at half capacity due to COVID rules. So, um, to answer your question, the funds that CDBG is applied to for MISI is specifically for preventing people from becoming homeless. Um, last fall, I believe, you're referring to what was called the Kansas something prevention program, eviction prevention program, um, and that was SPARC funds directly from the state, which MISI helped uh, qualify people for those funds. and. Um, help identify within city limits who was eligible for that. Um, when the local spark funds ran out, the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation took over doing that and um, MISI and Kansas Legal Services and I think also Shepherd's Crossing were helping refer people directly to that program so that those people did not become homeless. 
Did that answer your question? Yes, I think uh, that answers my question. It, so it's easy to forget that uh, Misai does other things outside of the shelter, and I just wanted to clarify that because I, I was misunderstanding a little bit. Well, and we are, one of your earlier agenda items tonight on, on the consent was the ESG, the Emergency Solution Grant money, which both the Crisis Center and MESI had. And MESI, um, in, in their draft budget from ESG funds, is 150000 for rapid rehousing specifically. So, like I said, CDBG is just one part, part of their, their budget. And from the homelessness standpoint, they have to use HUDs definitions f to use the HUD money. So. Uh, it's important to mention the, when the temperature dived uh, to 21 below this last winter, it put a real stress uh, that the homeless shelter was already full and there was no room. And uh, anyway, Be Able, I think, stepped in. but. Uh, right, with some know, churches, and they, they uh, rented some hotel rooms right, for, yeah. for the truly homeless. And helped uh, uh, with that situation. But it also points out that we're pushing the limits on some of our um, uh, systems, some of our facilities, so we don't have any capacity to uh, have an, a surge like that. <clears throat> okay, I don't have any problems with the plan. To me, the key point is you, you've taken the available funds, which, you know, you can't really argue. They gave you X amount, and you've, you've done a very good job of allocating it across the, the three, you know, four areas here, which looks pretty good by, by me. So at this point, we'll uh, open up a public hearing for anyone that wants to speak. There were no public comments received through a web submittal. Is there anyone that wishes to speak on this topic in person tonight? Okay, it doesn't look like we have anyone that wants to do that. So at this point, we'll close public comments. Now, is there any other further discussion from the commission? Are you ready for a motion? I'd be glad. If not, then we can have a motion. I move that the City Commission authorize submission of the Community Development Block Grant 2021 Annual Action Plan and Supporting Documents and authorize the Mayor and City Clerk to execute the sub-recipient agreements and the 2021 grant contract upon receipt from HUD. I'll second that. Okay, City Clerk, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Morris? Yes. Commissioner Hassel? Yes. Commissioner Estabrook? Yes. Commissioner Reddy? Mayor Butler? Yes. Motion carries 5 to 0. Okay, and we can move on to uh, the last item on the agenda for tonight, which is consider adopting the Stonehaven Master Plan and naming of the park and the pond. And we have, I think, two presenters. Park planner Alfonso is going to kick off the discussion. All right, let's pull this up real quick. All right, thank you, Mayor, uh, Commissioners, uh, Alfonso uh, Leva, Park Planner, um, here to present the uh, Stonehaven Park uh, Master Plan document as presented to and recommended by uh, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Uh, before, begin, before beginning, though, uh, quick little agenda. Uh, we'll look at the park background and location, uh, the, the master plan design, uh, the document itself, and then we'll end with some question and discussion and a motion. So background, in 2017, the park board recommended that the city accept the uh, parkland donation near the Miller Parkway and Highway K-18. In October of 18, uh, the city commission accepted that land donation. Um, by uh, um, by buyer, uh, yeah, by buyer company. Uh, in July 2019, uh, the city engaged Alfred Benish and Company to to master plan uh, the park. Uh, they were working with the buyer construction company uh, 
at that time. Um, uh, very very uh, involved with the infrastructure in that area. Uh, so uh, city staff felt that engaging Benish to then uh, engage with the master plan and, and make those connections with the infrastructure would be best uh, uh, all around. In 2020, uh, that uh, 15 acres of parkland was deeded to the city. And that same year, uh, we had a, uh, Benish was able to provide uh, city staff with a uh, draft master plan, uh, which was uh, presented uh, to the board. Um, and uh, also uh, at that time, there was a recommendation uh, to naming the park Sto Stonehaven Park and the pond, uh, Byer Pond. Later that year, after some uh, uh, initial uh, feedback that we got in that June uh, meeting, uh, we went, went back to the, uh, to the park board with a, a couple of other uh, iterations uh, of, of the design of the park. And in this past January, uh, this presentation, uh, this draft master plan uh, that I'm presenting to you was presented to the park board and they accepted it and recommended uh, this evening uh, for acceptance. So Stonehaven Park is uh, in the southwest uh, quadrant of the city. This is Miller Parkway, uh, the bridge that goes over K-18. Uh, the Stonehaven development in the, is in, in, in this area, uh, just to the west of the park. Stonehaven Park is about 15 acres, of which three acres of that is the uh, uh, Byer Pond. In this area, there's, there's quite a bit of elevation change on the south side, and most of the uh, of the south side, as, as you can see here, is just is just covered in vegetation. Uh, we're, we're definitely going to uh, go in there with some natural trails eventually, um, as well as uh, there on the north side as well. So, as you can see, really the the main attraction to this site, to this park, is is that three acre pond. And that was something that was uh, evident in the the master plan. Uh, the park board saw that as well. Um, and so we wanted to include amenities that would um, uh, engage uh, that pond. So we're looking at a perimeter trail uh, that's paved and then hiking trails throughout the park as well. Uh, we're also looking at picnic shelters, restrooms, a couple of uh, fishing docks and uh, some parking as well. As I had mentioned before in that uh, June 2020 park board meeting, uh, we did receive some feedback from the board about potentially uh, putting in a playground at that time. Um, so we went back to Benish and they provided a couple of areas where that could happen. Uh, we presented that to the, uh, to the park board in September. It was ultimately found that uh, you know, maybe we should wait until there's more uh, residents in that area to determine if, uh, if, if we want a playground. And if we do, we have an idea where we, wa where we want to put it, but uh, for now, as, as proposed in this master plan, there is no playground. Um, but again, we will reach back out to the community once uh, the, the surrounding uh, development is in and uh, gauge it again at that time. So this is the master plan that was provided by Alfred uh, Benish and Company, as you can see here. Uh, we're mostly looking on this uh, northern part of the park, uh, although, uh, well, it's about, a, it's about the same size, but track day is really just uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly vegetated. We will be putting uh, some natural trails eventually out there uh, and potentially a natural trail around uh, the stormwater treatment facility. But the main attraction is that pond. Um, this pond was uh, uh, created by the Byer family back in the 50s. Uh, I had a conversation with Kelly Briggs a couple months ago. Uh, I'm gonna be getting some, uh, some family history uh, eventually into the master plan. But he said that this was, uh, this was dammed up in the 50s and they've had it stocked uh, with fish uh, pretty much since then. So it's definitely the main attraction, uh, the main amenity of the park. And uh, we're looking to, to really put in those amenities that'll, uh, that'll help the users, the, you know, the residents, uh, the community to enjoy it, uh, much like uh, Dishman in uh, Annaberg Park. So we have a couple of uh, docks on each side. This one on the east would be ADA accessible, as well as uh, ADA parking uh, just to the southeast. 
The parking lot here on the southwest side of uh, the park, um, well, this is uh, another uh, iteration. Uh, there was some conversation between uh, Benish and city staff to get this, uh, what we thought to be uh, the most uh, efficient uh, uh, parking layout. Uh, the trail is about approximately half a mile um, around. Uh, this would be paved uh, um, and uh, ADA accessible. Uh, as proposed, there are a couple of picnic shelters and a restroom as well. Over here on the, on the north side is a, a lift station which is already built and functioning. Um, and uh, the stormwater treatment facility was one of the items that uh, city staff wanted to see before uh, 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 accepting this parkland. And it's really to, to kind of uh, get that, uh, it's about 13 acres that uh, comes into this, that, uh, that drains into this pond. And so this treatment facility would then be used to, to treat that water before it comes into the pond. So this was one of the items that uh, city staff wanted to see uh, in acceptance of this property. And so there's, uh, construction has begun up here, uh, has uh, begun up here uh, at Stonehaven. Uh, and really those are the, uh, uh, the, those are covered by the Stonehaven Development Benefit District. And so that would be the lift station. The, the treatment center is uh, in, uh, in design right now. Uh, construction soon. Uh, this uh, access way on the east side is already constructed. It's already built. Um, these have not been built yet, but they would be covered within the benefit district. And that's uh, the street that goes over the dam, uh, the parking here on the southeast side, um, the overflow of the dam, and then the outflow as well. And some of the items that would be covered by uh, the parks and recreation would then be some of the other amenities, the picnic shelters, the, the docks, the aeration. Uh, I believe the sign is actually donated. Um, it's going to be donated by, uh, uh, by our construction company. Um, but uh, so that is really our first uh, initial phase. Um, <clears throat> here in the next uh, uh, legislative meeting, you will see a, a, a consent agenda item uh, from us uh, to kind of get this somewhat close the loop. There will be a little bit left on the south side, but it is a proposal to have buyer come in and uh, um, complete uh, this uh, western side of the trail. Alfonso, um, before you leave this, yeah. the part, the stormwater treatment facility, mm -hmm. is that just temporary or is that permanent? No, that'll be a, term, a permanent feature. Okay. What was the reference in the material to during construction that the, some of the sediment are, might uh, contaminate the lake or something. So you're building a special facility to handle that. So that, so th yeah, that's what this is. It's a, uh, it's a permanent structure. Permanent one. Yeah. Yeah. We have about 13 acres that drain into uh, the pond. Uh -huh. And before it gets to this point, we want to make sure that it's, uh, doesn't have all those contaminants. So this is a, uh, essentially a, uh, a natural way um, of, of cleaning uh, that water before coming into I the I thought I remembered when we considered this the first time that this lake was actually a spring-fed lake and not depending on uh, rain runoff and having to uh, remove the sediment that kind of, if it's spring-fed then there's no sediment going into it. Well, there's still about 13 acres that does uh, drain into drain that. Drain into it. Yeah. So it yeah. isn't all spring fed. The, the pond is spring fed. The detention pond is groundwater running in. Yeah, is overflow. A different pond. Yeah. yeah. Spring yeah. fed, not spring fed. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate that. And so. This is definitely a little bit smaller than the usual uh, master plans that I've been before this uh, before the city commission. It's only about uh, five or six pages uh, uh, long, but uh, um, not as much uh, 
uh, input as we as we got from City Park or Warner, Warner Memorial Park, uh, that's for sure. But uh, we still wanted to have a plan uh, a plan in place as as we move forward and with this park, as we do with any kind of uh, uh, amenity that, that that we acquire. And so the introduction, the site history. Um, I, I do want to come back and we'll have it in, in our files anyway. Uh, Kelly Briggs mentioned that his sister is, uh, is the historian of the family and uh, wanted to expand on the site history a little bit more. Uh, we always like to have that kind of information for our, uh, for our park land. Uh, site context, you know, we're looking kind of what I explained before, um, uh, where this is located, some of the views that you get into the park um, as well. And then kind of the master plan process, talking of how uh, that process that we went through acquiring uh, the property as well as uh, going in and um, developing as we uh, as we did with the presenting to the park board uh, the iterations that we sh that we received from Benish and um, ultimately the playground discussion that was had the, the three options that we looked at um, I believe option one was out here towards the southwest uh, side of the park option two was a little bit further to the northwest. And then option three was something that we kind of came in later on and determined that might be our best option. Uh, however, as presented, uh, we aren't, we, uh, the plan is not uh, recommending uh, the playground. Uh, it's really recommending to wait and make a decision on that third uh, shelter or playground until the park users are known and, and, and we get uh, future funding for park development secured as well. Talk a little bit about the overall maintenance, the dam and the stormwater treatment facility, and then that bottom line. You know, how much, once this would all get built out, of course we're gonna go through some phasing. Uh, this isn't gonna all be done in, in, a, in a short uh, amount of time, uh, but we definitely have uh, various funding sources at our disposal and grants as well. Uh, something that we're def definitely gonna be applying for uh, is something like the Land and Water Conservation Fund this would be a great part to use that, uh, that fund. That, that, that would be something that we would need some match, but uh, uh, the, uh, um, you know, this, this plan, this, uh, this would be implemented in our, in our uh, CIP process, ultimately. I, and so I, I kind of... I have a question. Yeah. Um, the first map we see the very first one is the big park, Stonehaven Park. But all we see in the final park master plan is just the piece around the pond. Mm -hmm. So there's this plan doesn't have any detail for the other half of the park. So there's a lot of uh, uh, woody vegetation. I know you told us that. Yeah, right? on that southern part. Uh, we will go in there with some natural trails. That's something that uh, potentially we would do in-house uh, with our park crews, uh, would come in and do a natural trail. We want to leave it alone as much as possible. Uh, we want to keep a lot of the developed uh, 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 items of the park there on the north side. So it says in here that you're going to leave it natural? I mean, this is the master plan, right? Mm -hmm. So it needs yeah, to... Yeah, it mentions uh, that we will be uh, implementing natural surface trails in that area. doesn't seem like it's complete to me but so uh, I guess we're open to questions and discussion at this time okay I, I like the you know phased approach here I don't know it's got a you know price tag on it but you know obviously it's not gonna be done overnight and, and I think it is a good plan to, you know, focus on the, the lake. The idea was to preserve this thing because it's pretty clear, you know, uh, the, the water is about as clear as any as I've seen around here in a long time. And, and this project was designed to, to keep it that way. And I think it's important that uh, we don't develop the bottom side of that very much, that leaving it wilderness with a couple of trails is the way to go because when you do get a rain and that water's processed, you get the overflow, it's going to go down in there anyway, and uh, that's a good place for that excess water to go. And we, we, we talked about that at great length when we agreed to uh, accept the donation of this property because it, it, will, it will end up preserving, uh, preserving the lake. So I think, you know, gradually uh, 
you know, we, we get it built up to what you have around the lake. And the other part, uh, as Commissioner Morris mentioned, you could just put in the plan that, you know, we don't intend to develop that to any great extent, you know, other than a couple of trails that the deer will probably make for us, you know, in that area to be good enough. But uh, yeah. And we also want to, uh, much like we have at Dishman Lake, uh, Dishman Lake in, in Annenberg Park, um, uh, we have the Community Fisheries Assistance Pro Program administered by the, by the uh, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. Uh, so we want uh, to get uh, Byer Pond uh, up to uh, those uh, requirements for that program so that they could help uh, in, stock in keeping it stocked as well. I think the, the part around the pond is a, a, a good plan and uh, I, I hope that we're not looking too ambitious at, I mean, I like, we need a plan, but as far as filling in all the pieces and affording all the pieces, we have a serious problem with our parks department financially and so we, I don't, we can't race to, to actual, I mean, to accomplish what we've got here, roads and and uh, playgrounds and that kind of thing, shelters, whatever. So I think it has to be uh, put on no more, uh, uh, no, uh, not going forth any faster than the other parks that have been slowed down. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. And not, we're not gonna mow any more frequently here than we do on the others, so. And that's been slowed down, so. Uh, but I, I think it's good to obtain parkland as we have the opportunity and as people are donating, for heaven's sake. Um, and such an asset in this, this pond is so unique. It's the only, I thought, I thought it was totally spring fred. I didn't know that it had other water. But anyway, it's a good, it's a good plan. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Is Commissioner ready? Uh, I think the plan looks uh, good. Of course, it's going to take a, a long time to get all of this implemented. But on your implementation and cost estimate uh, page, you, know, you said the this was the estimates are developed based on 2020 dollars and represent construction costs only. So the 826 thousand dollars we see here are construction costs only, right? Correct. Uh, it says design and inspection costs are sewn separately. Is that separately in this packet? Yeah, they're at the very bottom. Administrative costs not okay. included. The design and inspection. Design so and that's inspection. Uh, 140,000 yeah. together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now some of these phases we could do internally, uh, 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 depending on uh, on scheduling. Right. Uh, but that is kind of a um, if we wanted to get this all completed, this is what it would take. Yeah, and that's why it's going to take a long time to get there, mainly because whenever we talk about an environment that in which this pond is placed in, it's going to take a lot more work for just one restroom or even just the lighting because of the location of all of this. So I understand it's going to take us a while to get to where we all need to be, and that's why this is the master plan, and the retaining wall is going to be critical to all of it as well. Um, I think it's a good plan. Um, I think by the time all of it, all of these phases uh, get done, it might take anywhere from five to ten years. But it's it's a good start, and um, it's a beautiful place. So it's good that we can take advantage of that and make something of it uh, based on certain timelines, and also updating some of those finances. Like you said, if it's from 2020, I don't know what this would be by the time we do any one of these smaller pavement, for example, I don't know the cost of concrete or labor by that time or anything of that sort. But if this is supposed to be the lower end of that, I would imagine it's gonna be past uh, million five or something, maybe even by the time we get all of it done. Um, I don't have any qualms about the master plan as presented. Thank you, Commissioner. Is the construction that's going on up there now, is that just the road going in or the pavement or what is it? Yeah, so uh, a chunk of it, uh, um, I believe it most, I don't know if most of the infrastructure uh, is, uh, is in. Um, I, I know I was just out there today. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, Byer is, is continuing development here uh, uh, just to the west of the park. 
Uh, Amherst Drive is in, I believe, up to about here. Um, this road is not in uh, quite yet. Um, and the trail uh, or service road uh, is in here for, for the lift station. Um, uh, there is no sidewalk yet over on this the east side of Amherst. There is one proposed, um, but it isn't in yet. Um, I, I did ask today, I asked uh, uh, Brian Johnson, our city engineer, you know, do we say that the park is open? And he said, well, to me, we have, uh, we have some sidewalk there and we have the street. He would say yes, but potentially the contractor may have a different opinion since they're st still in the area. So um, it is public land, um, but right now they are encouraging that people do not uh, uh, go down this Amherst as there is still construction uh, ongoing. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, that is a bit difficult to access right now, so it's probably not recommended that people go out and try to walk down there. I, I, I went over there the other day to, to take a look, and it, uh, it it takes a little bit of hiking to get uh, to get down there, and probably best to wait till they get their construction finished. So we can open this up to uh, you know public comments. We did not receive any public comments uh, through web submission. Is there anyone here in person that would like to speak about this uh, particular Stonehaven master plan tonight? Okay, seeing no one, we'll close public comments and come back to the commission for any additional comments. Yeah, um, Mayor, I just want to make one, one last comment, and this uh, pertains to all of our discussions from 6 o'clock to now. You know, I'm just amazed at our community. We, we started off talking about a museum, a potential museum, and we talked about Aggieville bringing in the MH um, Manhattan High School alumni, the Stonehaven Master Plan, and the Indoor Aquatics. So these are community members just coming up with wonderful ideas and um, the future of Manhattan looks pretty good with all of these, I believe, innovative ideas that are coming before us. Financing will always be the bigger piece of this, but it's uh, the idea machine is out there and I'm glad and excited about for Manhattan. Mayor, I move that we adopt the Stove Haven Park Master Plan dated December 2020 as presented and approved naming the park and pond as Stove Haven Park and Bear Pond. I second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So City Clerk, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Hattisall. Yes. Commissioner Estabrook. Yes. Commissioner Reddy. Yes. Mayor Butler. Yes. Commissioner Morris. Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, taking part in the meeting, and at this point, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.